to go. Good evening, everybody. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in Mark, but I want to start you off on a thought in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, two scriptures first. Find Ephesians 4, and we're going to then go to, we're actually going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 17 says, I, again, this, uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk. When he says walk, it's just an old way of saying what? What is he saying? Good, how you live, okay? So don't live like Gentiles do. He goes on, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, like somebody turned the lights off. <laughs> you ever heard the phrase, lights on and nobody's home? Well, this is the opposite. The brain is there, but the lights are off. He says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So we're going to talk about blindness tonight. And then just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. One of these Wednesday nights we're going to have a Bible drill. I'm going to find out how fast you can turn your pages and find the thing. I know. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. I miss our Bible drills. 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are... All right, so when you're lost, there is, there is something about the good news of the gospel that's just not there for you. Verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath, here's our word, blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, as we go back, let's go back to Mark chapter 8, where we're going to spend our time this evening. Jesus spent a lot of time uh, dealing with blindness. Um, he healed a lot of blind people. <clears throat> now, there are two that are recorded in the Gospel of Mark here and also in Mark chapter 10. But when Jesus healed somebody, it was, his, it was not the healing that he wanted, was it? We learned that last week. He always sees something deeper that needed to be fixed. And it was always in their heart, their soul, their mind. Um, they needed healing at that point. So... Uh, if there's one thing that was, that was true about Israel, and I don't have time to take you to all the scriptures, Romans chapter 9 and 10 says blindness has occurred to Israel. Israel was blind to their Messiah, and Israel was blind to the opportunity God gave them. And so um, Jesus, when he heals a blind man, is kind of like, that's what I want to do for all of Israel. I want to remove the blindness. Um, so... Uh, we come to Mark chapter 8, and we'll pick up here in verse 22. And Jesus is getting near to a small village called Bethsaida, which is, again, remember, you, you have two sections, two extremes of Israel. On the north part, what's the name of the, of the body of water? It's got like four or five names, but it's called the Sea of Galilee, the Lake Gennesaret, or Lake Tiberias, all of that up in the north. What's the bottom body of water? What was that called? The Dead Sea. So Israel is not exactly between those two. It's actually over west of them. Jordan River ran between them and over towards the, uh, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea is where Israel was. But that's kind of the north-south area. And all along the north, around that little lake, Jesus spent most of his time, which is unusual. Why would anybody be interested in following a not-so-popular guy? You want normally, if you like somebody and you follow them on Twitter, People want to follow a successful person. They want to follow somebody that's making influence. And yet, somebody who was very humble and mainly ministered to people in a very secluded and backwards area, if you want to be blunt, that man changed the world. That's who Jesus is. So he's coming up to Bethsaida, and uh, a group of people bring a blind man to Jesus. And believe you me, the blind man wants to see. So, uh, verse 22. We'll start there in Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. 
and he comes back to Bethsaida. He's already been there once in chapter 6. He's now coming in verse 22 again. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and they besought him to touch him. Just right there. Always, always, when you read your Bible, try to put it in your own words so that you're getting what he's saying. What does the word besought mean? Begged. To beseech. Remember Romans 12, 1? I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. He's begging us to stop sacrificing our life on the altar of success and on the altar of the world and saying, live your life for the Lord. He's begging Christians to get their eyes off the world. So they beseech him that he would touch uh, uh, um, the blind man. So um, this blind man is uh, crippled in a way that we're kind of not, not usually um, can understand. Uh, there are certain illnesses that stop you from being able to work, provide for your family. Um, they stop you from having any liberty. You are stuck. That illness, like if, if you know, if you couldn't walk, in this day and age, you could, you you can use a wheel, uh, um, a wheelchair. I was going to say a wheelbarrow, <laughs> but um, in that day. If you were crippled, you couldn't. Somebody had to carry you. Is that right? You understand? Okay. So uh, if you were blind, um, would you trust somebody who couldn't hear to work for you on a farm? No. Now, you can actually do more work not being able to hear than you can by not being able to see. But when somebody got a crippling disease, it, was, it, it put them out of society. They were, they were poor. They were destitute. They had no hope. You can understand, we take care of everybody today. But in that day, when Jesus would come into town, wow, did they bring in people who had never had any hope before. It was so exciting. So here they come, and they asked, they begged um, Jesus to heal um, um, this man. But I thought about this. Uh, the man, could a, could a blind man find his way to Jesus? That's breathtaking. So what did the blind man need? A friend, didn't he? Now, he's got several friends. Evidently, there's several of them that say, we're going to take you. I don't know if we have to carry you or just walk you. We're going to get you to Jesus. And that's what a soul winner is. I could never have found out about Jesus and God and heaven and hell and the Bible unless somebody gave me a gospel track and invited me out to church and held my hand. I tell you, when I sat down in church that first Sunday morning and I sat in the middle of way back in the back of the pews and I didn't have a Bible and this guy scoots right. He must have. I was sort of in a position where nobody would bother me. I didn't want anybody next to me. And this guy rudely scoots right over next to me, opens up his Bible and lets me follow along, look in the Bible as my pastor preached. I needed him. You see what I'm saying? He needed to invade my bubble. Okay? So this guy has somebody who invades his bubble and says, we're going to go get some help. He's probably given up hope. How about the Ethiopian eunuch? What did he say he needed? Yes. Yes. Because what does Philip say? He says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I accept some men guide me? And what an observation. And so up pops Philip, and he get, tells him about Jesus. How about the palsied man? They broke open the roof where Jesus was standing. Somebody, some people have said, and I kind of agree with it, it was Peter's house, which would be very embarrassing. Peter now has to patch the roof. <laughs> but they break open the roof, drop this guy down. He's never going to get to Jesus unless he had those four friends. So thank God for friends who got you to the gospel or got you to Jesus or gave you the gospel. Our world needs soul winners. Don't, they don't need just Jesus because they're not going to learn about Jesus without us. So um, uh, the next thought here, look at verse 22. I want to read it again. Again, I try to, when I read my Bible, I try to read it like I've never read it before. And I'm on my 42nd time through. So I could say, oh, I've already read this. Oh, I already know this. And I don't. The, the, the wonderful thing about Scripture is it's alive. And I see new stuff every time. I read it, and when he comes to verse 22, look at this. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. 
There was a time when a centurion says, all you have to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus had all power. He didn't have to touch him. But did you know there's something wonderful about a touch? When you're low and you're discouraged and somebody just puts their hand on your shoulder and says, I love you. You're, you're going to be okay. A hug is invaluable. Um, I have concluded probably of all the people that end up in Sarsfield Court, probably a good majority of them haven't been hugged in decades. So this, this thing, would you please touch him? It's just a, 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 a thought that when Jesus had some lepers that came up to him, what did Jesus do with the lepers? Did he go, unclean, stay your distance? Or what did Jesus do? He went up and he touched the lepers because that was important. They had not been touched by another human for years because of their leprosy. And here comes Jesus, and right through all of the bubble, he comes in and he touches them, and they were healed. Uh, the woman with a continuous hemorrhage, remember that? We read that back. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. She really would have loved to have touched his, his finger or his hand, but she said, if I just touch, okay. so. When, when I was uh, first saved, you know what they always used to say, we need a touch of God is what they would call it. When I was just a new Christian, I didn't know what that meant, but I came, out to, I came to know what it meant, that God would step in and would touch the hearts of people because we're expecting people to respond to the gospel, but you're not going to respond without the Holy Spirit gripping your heart and saying, crumble, say amen. <laughs> Um, uh, get right, get excited, something. So, uh, verse 23 introduces a, a unique style of healing that Jesus did. Verse 23, and he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and he put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw awe. Now, just hold there for a second. <clears throat> so they've brought this blind man to Jesus can they do anything more? They've done what they can. It's time for Jesus to work, amen? And so Jesus takes them now. Isn't that wonderful? When you pray and you pray and you say, Lord, please, I'm bringing before my need, before you, I'm bringing this person needs to get saved. I'm bringing, that's, that's what we do. And then God says, I'll take over now. I'll take control. I'll take charge. I like that. I'm not here. Um, so verse 23 goes on. It said, he took him by the hand and um, he takes him away. He says, he says, uh, it says, and he led him out of the town. Now he's just come into the town. People bring a blind man to him and he takes the blind man and he leads him out of town. We've kind of been watching that for the last few chapters, haven't we, where Jesus doesn't like to, the circus of the healing anymore. Does he, does, he, does he not want to heal the man, yes or no? It's kind of a double negative. Does he not want to not heal him? <laughs> he wants to heal him. But he doesn't want to heal him so that people only want healing on the outside, okay? That's what we're learning. So uh, did you know why we have church and not discos? Why we don't entertain? Why I can't even keep Eric awake during my preaching? Do you know why? Because... If we're all about feelings, you'll miss Jesus. And if I am at times boring, and I don't like being boring, it's not about me. It's not about our feelings. Because if we only come because we get a great buzz at church, and if we only come because, oh, they got great scones and great music and all this stuff, we're not there for Jesus. And the most important thing that Jesus is trying to say is, guys, I want to heal, I want to Save your life. I want to turn you back to society. I want to give you back your life again. But I don't want circuses. I don't want bouncing castles. I don't want discos. I don't want lights. I want you to want me. Then he spits on his eyes. Now that's very un-Western. That is Western Europe. I mean, if I <laughs> put this on your eye, I mean, think about just how, how, Embarrassing this would be to actually have watched. It didn't matter. Um, 
when, when, when God wants to do something in my life that maybe is embarrassing or is so different than what anybody else might do, what am I supposed to do? Yield. I may have a whole different way that I think God should work on me or that God should work on her or that God should do this or that. And God says, no, I'm going to spit and I'm going to do something that you think is vulgar or base is the Bible word or so, so low, so humiliating. So uh, you wouldn't want to go into a surgery and see what a doctor has to do to get rid of cancer. You wouldn't want to um, uh, learn about what doctors have to learn and surgeons have to learn about dealing with opening up bodies and things. It's very, um, I don't know what you want to call it, it's very um, un, um, I'm trying to think of a, a proper word. It's very upsetting. It's even offensive to think about cutting somebody open and all that blood. But what do we do when the doctor says we have to operate? If you have something that's about, if, you have, if your appendix is about to rupture and the doctor says we've got to operate, you say, okay. You don't want the, all the details, do you? You just want to let the, put me out and, and get me through this. All right, so why don't we do that with God? Why don't, from now on, why don't we come into the church and we say, I'm in surgery now, Lord, whatever you need to do. That's the attitude that we need. That's what this man's going to teach us is he doesn't flinch. He doesn't, and the other, and nobody else stops. Oh, don't do that because, do you know what spit was? It was unclean. It was, uh, it was unhealthy. You just don't do that. But you know what? When Jesus wants to do it, I guarantee you, it was clean. And it was healing. So he let, of all people, let Jesus do something that nobody else could do. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, show you another time he does this just for fun. Go to John chapter 9, the Gospel of John chapter 9. A man is born blind. And in John chapter 9 and verse 6, uh, the disciples have asked Jesus, did this man sin? <laughs> He's born blind. That's a stupid question. He's born blind, and they say, did he sin to get blind? Which would be like, okay, he must have sinned in the womb then. Or did his parents sin? I mean, they asked a theological question, which was stupid. And Jesus said, neither. He's blind for the glory of God. Watch this. Chapter 9 in verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. He made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. That was the meaning of Siloam. And he went his way, therefore, and he washed and came seeing. All right, so Jesus does this not just once. Um, and he placed his man, go back to Acts, uh, Mark chapter 8, and pick up in verse uh, 23, he took the blind man by the, by the hand and he led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and he put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw anything. Did you, do you see aught? Now this is very unique. Watch, watch the man's response. And he looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. I see men as trees walking. Now, I've looked at all of you already this evening and not one of you look like a tree walking. So I can't imagine what he's seeing. I can only guess. Uh, I mean, you ever seen a kaleidoscope? Do you know what a kaleidoscope is? All right, so it's got multiple mirrors in there and you point it at something, all of a sudden you see 50 things instead of just one thing, okay. So when he's looking through his eyes, he sees your hands jutting out, your multiple head, I don't know. The fact that he sees men walking, I don't know if there are people walking behind him or if everything is in motion, all we know is nothing's making sense. Now he was blind, now he sees, but he doesn't see right. Okay, so um, to this man, all the darkness was gone, but he thought he saw men looking like trees. So what was wrong? Did Jesus make a mistake? What do you think? Before we read any more, did Jesus make a mistake and accidentally only 
you know, heal them the wrong way. Okay, you heard about these doctors that after they sew you up and you are sitting there recovering and they come back and they say, uh, we've counted up all of the sutures and all the scissors and all of the tools and we're missing two and we think we, got, we left them inside, you know. <laughs> we gotta go open you up again. That would be dreadful. But so there are mistakes done in surgery, but does Jesus make mistakes? Okay, we're gonna get there. Excellent. Okay, so very good. This man was healed, um, and but something is missing, and we're going to see it here in a second. Um, let's go to Second Corinthians. We were in Second Corinthians. Go back to Second Corinthians, chapter four, in verse six. Okay. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, just think there for a second. When God created the universe, what, um, um, what was missing when he created the universe? Light. So he says, he created the heaven and the earth, all the universe, and this ball of water, but it's dark, and he says, let there be light. And so it was a next step, okay? Go to Philippians. Philippians, chapter one and verse six. Philippians one, six. Let me ask uh, Gavin, the moment you got saved, were you now perfect? Humanly speaking, are you now without need of any kind of work on you. Not. Look in Philippians 1, 6, being confident. I am definitely not perfect, and neither are you. But I am confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you. Now, don't read that as saying, he which began to save you. No, that's not what he's saying. But the moment you got saved, he began a good, what's the word? And he's going to perform it and finish it all the way to the end, to the day of Jesus Christ. Psalm 138, verse 8, without going there, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. He will polish and break off the rough edges, and he will finish what he started with me. So we are saved, but boy, do we still need some work. And that's what Jesus wanted to teach, that even people who get saved, boy, they need a lot of growing. They come with a lot of confusion as needed. What was the word that you used? Distortion. They come with a lot of distorted views about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, and they need something that corrects that, okay? Did you know there are three works that Jesus does on every person? Number one, he requires the work of surrender first. He needs the person, like the blind man, to just stop and trust. And that blind man, unable to see, unable to guide the hands of Jesus, he just surrenders. Salvation is not you doing anything. It is a complete surrender to him. Uh, second work is the work of salvation. Who does that? That's what Jesus does. So the, first, the third work is the work of clarity. That's where the, the Christian matures and grows and gets more understanding the further you go for the Lord. So here's, uh, Gavin, you're saved five years now? Okay, how old are you total in normal years? <laughs> Not dog years. How, many, how old are you? You're 30, all right. At 30 years old, there's some things you should understand, but I guarantee you, as you read the Bible and as you learn the Christian life, there are some things that are not gonna really mean anything to you until you're 50, 60, 70, until you've had some serious heartaches and troubles. And all of a sudden, the Bible becomes clearer and clearer. So a lot of people think, I did, I, think, I thought the moment I got saved, all my troubles are over. I, I can't sin anymore, I thought. <laughs> I don't understand why we picked that up, why we, do, why we think that. But uh, this man needed what I'm calling a second healing. It's not a second salvation, 
But watch here. Verse 25, 825 again. And he put his hands on him again, back in Mark chapter 8, verse 25. So he says, I see men as trees walking, verse 25. And after that, he, Jesus, put his hands upon his eyes and made him to look up. And he was restored and saw every man now clearly. So Jesus now does a second work. I need you to go to Matthew 13. I'll show you what he's working on now. His eyes are seeing, aren't they? But his brain is not. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13. Matthew 13, 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not. They have eyes, but they can't see. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they. What's the third thing? So just because somebody has eyes, does it, it, they can't see what God's trying to show them, and their understanding, what did we read there in 2 Corinthians, is darkened. Let's keep going, verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed, it has become gross, full. And their, eye, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand, there's that word again, with their heart and should be converted, that I should heal them. Chapter 15 and verse 10. 15, 10. Listen to what Jesus says many, many times. 15, 10. I'm still in Matthew. Yeah, did I say Mark? Matthew 15, 10. I'm still in Matthew. Thank you. Just want to make sure everybody's with me. Good, thank you. Matthew 15, 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and, what's the next thing? So you need both. Go to verse 16, still in chapter 15, verse 16. And he said unto them, are ye also without? All right. Uh, verse 17. Do ye not yet understand? Chapter 16. And verse 9. Do ye not yet? I'm sorry. Do ye yet not understand? In verse 11, chapter 16, verse 11. How is it? that ye do not understand, so on and so forth. All right, so what is he wanting? When I look at people, I see you upright, homo sapiens, intelligent looking, well-behaved, okay? But not everybody sees people as calm as, as, as say some people are terrified of people. Some people have gone through times in their life where they're terrified of life. They can't even go outside of the house. Something's broken inside them, isn't it? So they can see, but some, they, they don't understand, and they live in fear. And Christians do that as well, and the devil loves to, to close our eyes and give us, boy, give us a, a, a confusion. So I, I, I call this, uh, instead of, uh, man, you said it to me twice. I can't remember the word you said it. Distortion. Distortion. Instead of seeing the world distorted, I called it that he's confused by what he sees. He doesn't know what he's looking at. And a lot of Christians are the same. Uh, but verse 25, back in Mark chapter 8, verse 25, says, after he put his hands upon his eyes and he made him look up, he was restored and he saw every man clearly. So now the man sees everything as it, they really are. Uh, you know, if if if... If his, fir if, if his first healing was all that he got, he would have been in a sad state, okay? I mean, how do you have Christmas with a guy who thinks everybody's a tree, right? <laughs> that was a good joke. Um, he would have stumbled. He would have been greatly discouraged in life because, I mean, every time he'd see people, they'd be like trees. He's trying to make sense of all of this stuff. But now both his eyes and his understanding have been opened, and he was safe. And this is the point. We need that. We need often. Uh, I'm going to hope that everybody in this room is saved, that you're born again, that Jesus Christ saved you. I had a day and a time where you once were lost, now are found, was blind, but now you see. But just because you're saved does not mean that your Christian life makes sense and that the world has any semblance of sense. But you know, when a Christian 
has a daily walk with Jesus and a healing walk with Jesus. Let me just be real plain. You need to constantly say, Lord, I don't know if I see things right. Are you listening? You need to pray, Lord, I may have everything I think figured out and I may be just as wrong as can be. Lord, I need to make sure that my understanding is healed. And you may need to pray that often. That second work is that work of Philippians 1, 6, where Jesus promises that he will continue the work and finish the work that he began. So don't be too hesitant to say, I, 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 I now understand I was confused about X, Y, and Z. And that is very important. Uh, verse 26, and he sent him away to his house. Did he send him back into the city? No, no, no. He says, I want you to go home. Do you think his family was kind of freaked out when they saw him coming in and he started hugging everybody? And he says, I see you. Must have been awesome. Um, I got some questions for you. Um, what was the problem? Nita calls it uh, one thing. I can't, my brain is, I got all my words and I cannot replace my word with your word. Distract, no, distortion, distortion. All right. I, uh, trying to put my word confusion there. But what was it, what was wrong? What was the Bible word that he was lacking? Understanding, understanding, okay? Um, what does the Bible say? When we get saved, we have not only our heart is darkened, but our mind is darkened. So there's a work on, as, uh, let me tell you, the more you read the Bible, the more your brain is repaired. And, and, and so don't, don't just think, I'll just come to church. Nah, and that's all I need from the Bible. You need as much Bible as possible. Uh, so his perception is a good word to use. His perception of, of things in his life. So um, uh, you wake up and uh, you look at your phone and there's a text from the office and, the, and the, your employer says you're, re you're, you're redundant. Okay, what are your normal human response would be? I'm going to get them. I'm going to sue them. <laughs> this is not right. Your perception could be totally wrong. That could be a gift from God. You understand what I'm saying? And you may need to quickly pray, Lord, am I looking at this thing right? Help me have the right perception of what's happening in my life. There are people in our church that are having some really hard times health-wise. If you and I were going through it, we probably would curse God and want to die. But I think the reason why they're still faithful and they still keep going is because they prayed for God, give us the right perception of what you're doing in our lives. I'm telling you, we have a lot to learn. You understand? We need our understanding really changed. So how do you get that second miraculous healing? When you ask for it, they brought us this, would you touch him. And when Jesus said, what do you see? He says, it doesn't make sense, Lord. I see men as trees walking. Now, when he said that, he's not saying, and they look fantastic. He's saying, it doesn't make sense. So when you finally are, answer, when you finally are honest with the Lord and say, Lord, life doesn't make sense to me. The, the Bible's not making sense to me. Church doesn't seem to make sense to me. The gospel doesn't make sense to me. Then you need to pray and ask, Lord, Touch me again. I remember the day you saved me. I need you now to give me understanding. Open my eyes. Not that you're spiritually blind and, and unsaved, but that your understanding needs to be clarified, needs to be untwisted for help. Does that make sense? Isn't that a great, great short lesson that the Lord just wanted to teach? I guarantee you the disciples didn't get that. But that's why Mark writes this down so that for ages to come, people would come and ponder what we just learned and go, oh, no wonder they didn't get it. It's deep. It really is. All right. So ask for it, wait for it, and yield to it when the Lord begins to teach you and unravel your confusion. Okay, let's take some prayer requests.